a really great presentation. Um, as there's so much complexity in this new regulation, you know, the Order 650, it's hundreds of pages long, 14 or 15 uh, supplementary regulations, some published, some in draft, and I think it's going to make a great read uh, later on. Um, I'm going to share with you my journey, and this is uh, my perspective. Yours might be slightly different. Uh, I've spent uh, my career since about 1992 working in international markets, emerging markets, Asia Pacific, in one way or another, starting first of all in uh, research in heart disease in Asia Pacific for about 10 years, moving to pharma and then medical devices. And so this is my collective uh, experience. It's been wonderful. I wouldn't choose to work in any other area other than the emerging markets. It is absolutely uh, rewarding, but it's uh, not been without pain and tears. Um, so this is an honest account. I will start with a global perspective and then try and drill down because this represents the context in which I think about the emerging markets. But first of all, uh, Edward Life Sciences. Uh, I've worked for Edward Life Sciences for the last uh, 12 months. We are the leaders in heart valve technology and hemodynamic monitoring. We bring solutions for the critically ill and inoperable patients around the world and have done so, been the leaders in this area of heart valve technology for the last 60 years. We have 8,500 employees and uh, a global footprint, footprint in manufacturing and we are also highly committed to the community and we do fantastic philanthropic work uh, in health-related and community causes. And we're based here in Irvine, just one hour up the road. So here's uh, my perspective on the international markets. Uh, this is from the American Chamber of Commerce in 2010. And if we look at the mature markets, in the blue is population, <laughs> representing around about 13% of the world's population, yet consuming more than 76% of the world's medical devices. And if we take the BRIC countries, just Brazil, Russia, India, and China, representing 50% of the world's population, yet only consuming around 4.5% of medical devices. If we take now what's happened in the last five years, keeping that graph in mind, we've seen increasing government expenditure in, uh, in health, increasing private health insurance, rising incomes, and aging populations. Combine that with the global financial crisis in 2008, and this is almost like a perfect storm, a perfect opportunity for the multinational companies that saw the opportunity to now make some profit. Looking at these markets here, 4.5% medical devices, this is a cash cow where we saw in some industries in the US and in Europe, the market either going flat or negative or slowing growth, and most multinational companies are in business in around about 100 countries, and suddenly these opportunistic markets that just were minimally revenue adding are now looking to be something else. But be careful what we wish for. It wasn't really the cash cow that we thought it was going to be. It became more challenging. Because these were not, these markets were not the drivers with that small percentage of medical device uses, we, in many cases, strategically and deliberately under-resourced those markets. So they had bare minimum infrastructure. And if we go back five or, five or 10 years, most of these markets weren't even regulated. And we had secretaries and other junior technical people perhaps looking after product registrations. So the infrastructure wasn't really there. 
um, at the time when we were perhaps not for all companies, some are further advanced, some are further behind. So there are a great many risks and rewards to go into this market, to be truly global. And some of you may recognise some of the points he made uh, with the Ascendra report that was uh, put out two years ago. Um, we have this increasing complexity uh, uh, um, regulatory environment. Davy's presentation is a great example. And then how do we put in those holistic uh, processes and systems for governance, management and compliance and ensuring the quality of our products and having consistent standards across both internal and our external partners. And many of our systems were set up with the US in mind and Europe in mind when we started all, all this way back ago and not necessarily in, um, in our international or emerging market countries. So in order to take advantage of these opportunities, we have to be change agents and rethink about how our traditional models that work for the USA, work for Europe, are perhaps no longer going to work for business uh, work in our international markets. We have to change our business model, our technology, rethink our regulatory as well. So it's about having infrastructure, putting in infrastructure versus just focusing on compliance. And we need a holistic approach, approach right across our commercial ecosystem. That means legal, IT, regulatory, technical, commercial, the whole lot. It has to be an integrated solution. And yet we're here at the beginning trying to still establish uh, some, basic, some basic processes. So for me, it's about identifying what do I need, whether I'm in-house in sourcing or I'm outsourcing, what is it that I need for my international markets, for people, for the processes and the systems that I need? These are the basic things that what do I need to make this work? And I'm gonna have to make some choices between in-house and outsourcing because I simply, cannot do it all. But this is, I'm sure you've seen this many times before, the real dangers lurk well, be well beneath the surface. And remember, we have strategically under-resourced these markets in many, for many years. And so perhaps my question is, do we really know what's going on under the surface of those markets as we drive our commercial strategy in these countries what's been going on in those past 10, 10 years in some of these small countries. In some ways, the way I think about the world, it can be represented numerically. We can describe the world in tables and find solutions from that. So I have a focus on numbers. Outside of the USA, there's 193 countries recognized by the United Nations, not including uh, Taiwan at the moment. Of that, 106 are regulated for medical devices in some way, meaning we need some kind of documentation in order to sell that product. If we take medical device, the mid-sized medical device companies, and we're talking maybe about the size of Edwards to even large, outside sales outside of the USA is usually in at least 100 countries or more than 100 countries. And of those 100 countries, around about 60% are already regulated today. And so it means as we expand our business, as we want to stay in business in those countries, first of all, it means that we can expect some of those countries to become regulated. And our problem is going to be, and I think Malaysia is a great example um, of this um, be, uh, country becoming regulated where we're already doing business and perhaps doing small levels of sales in those countries and what is the regulatory resource that it's going to take to get those now registered and is that is the cost of that activity now going to realise results later on. We can take short-term losses, but what is the long-term plan for those you know, low-volume sale products? How do we get that whole portfolio that we're now selling um, reg registered in those markets? And are we going to do that, as an example? It also means if we expand into other countries, they are already regulated. 
Most companies have somewhere in some benchmarking that I've done in the order of around about 1,500 product registrations outside of the USA. And so that's quite a lot of product registrations. If you're a bigger, if you're a juggernaut and you're, um, if you're a J&J &J juggernaut, you might have two and a half thousand. But you're going to probably have at least 1,000 product registrations and how are these going to be managed? And we know that the future, I don't have to say it, we know the future is more regulated countries, longer approval times and more requirements. Let's take, let's take that 1,500 registrations and look at what that might mean in terms of the operations that we need uh, to manage that. So if I say that we've got 1,500 registrations, around about 70% of our regulatory effort will be about what I would call stay in market change notifications, modifications to the licenses, renewals, re-registrations, corrections, and around 30% of our effort is about putting new product into market. So I call it the stay in market versus access to new market. This is a really important number for me because it says, well, how do I make decisions about what I'm going to put in the market and keep in the market because I need a regulatory resource to maintain it, not just in country, but at the global level where the control of all the dossiers are. And how am I going to govern it and how am I going to manage it? So you know the old story, check, you know, how do I know what's due, renewed and when? And what are the gate controls to prevent unregistered product entering into the market? So now I'm going to stop, switch tact a little bit and just focus in on Pan Pacific. It's variable. Most of the uh, Asia Pacific countries now are, getting uh, uh, have, are being regulated. Population is hugely variable, 54,000 to 1.3 billion. Uh, GDP from 507, from 537 to 10, to 10 billion. Uh, the huge variabil variability in the GDP per capita. So it's not going to be a one size fits all and our business models have to try and accommodate this great variability. And by nature that means that our com I look at our, what our commercial or our business model looks like and then how do I set up a regulatory model that fits that. So, for example, if we're just talking about even just Asia Pacific, in some countries we may have exclusively direct sales. So we've got an office in there. It might be Singapore or Bangkok and you've got an office and you've got a regulatory person who's doing your product registrations. You've got an in-house RA person or you might have a regulatory agent or consultant that you're working with. You may have exclusively indirect sales. For example, in Indonesia, you may, uh, as an example of Vietnam, you may not have an office and you may have a distributor. So who's filing that? That's almost what I'm going to call outsourcing by default, in that you've got a distributor in that market and who is doing that product registration for you? or putting that product into the market? Is it the distributor's um, own staff, an RA person, or do they have a third party that are doing those product registrations? We might have a hybrid model where we have both direct and indirect, in-house RA, we might have distributors uh, doing, uh, doing RA, or we could still have consultants. So it's a very variable model. And then, we look down to say, well, we're talking about our presence. What kind of presence do we have in those countries versus having no office, versus having a representative office, versus having a legal entity in that country? And that very much uh, has implications for who can be the product license holder and who is the import holder. And do we know that? Do we know who is the actual license holder and import holder for every single registration that we own? So this comes back down to visibility and transparency, compliance and liability. To know with every single product registration that we have for our product in every country, 
who is the legal holder of that licence, whose name is on there, and who is the, who is the importer of that licence. It's going to be very important, I'll talk about later, what happens if you decide to acquire a distributor. And this, these models help direct the kind of infrastructure that we need as well. And the reality is we are going to have a mix of all of these, particularly in some of the emerging market countries. You saw that variability. So the small sales volume is never going to warrant having uh, an office in there, Bangladesh or some of the other smaller countries, Sri Lanka, for example. So we talk about infrastructure. We have to give people the tools and we've got to have the tools in-house. And here again, I'm going to keep coming back and saying a lot of the systems that have been set up have been specifically designed for the global manufacturer who's in the US. So these are systems that work for USA, for FDA, or work for Europe that don't necessarily work well at the moment for our international markets. What are the blocking systems that are in place to release unauthorised product and not ship them? Regulatory submissions database. How do, you, how do we track internally? And you know, Excel spreadsheets are not the answer of tracking our registrations. We need relational databases that manage this portfolio of 1,500 or more registrations in order to have good control of these. We need to have real-time access, because we can't do anything if we're just tracking things on spreadsheets. And I talk to a lot of people in industry, and a lot of the international markets are tracked that way. Sometimes it's just tracked locally, and sometimes it is tracked centrally. But that's not gonna fly anymore, particularly as we see not only the increasing degrees of regulation, but we're seeing increasing enforcement of penalties for non-compliance and a greater concern about compliance. And after all, everybody globally wants the assurance of safe product, no matter where you are. So what have we done to address this? The first thing that we did was put in place a process that says, how do we control our product registrations? What do you get to register in the international markets? Because globally, I need a group of people to supply those dossiers. And if we just register everything, then we're traveling salesmen. We register everything, we see what sells, and that's our strategy. In that case, um, we don't need any marketing or commercial people, we just need more regulatory people. So we've got to have uh, a strategy for controlling that. And, you know, I know the story of the eager young salesperson who is a hostage in surgery for 45 minutes and someone says, if you had this product, I would buy it. And they rush back to their catalogue, look at it and say, wow, we've got that. Ring up the regulatory person in country. Quickly, quickly, urgently, register, register, register. They act very urgently. They ring up global headquarters. Quickly, urgently, urgently register this product. And before that product is even registered, six months later, that that salesperson has left the company, the surgeon's now interested in something else, and people are still processing this registration. So we have to control that resource. And remember, every new product that we put into the market goes into that bucket of maintaining, of being maintaining the registration. It's a little bit like an analogy is incidence and prevalence. Incidence is the new thing that's happening. It goes into the bucket of prevalence, which means it needs to be maintained. And the amount of regulatory resource that we need to put a new product into the market that sells a great deal of volume and does great in, the, in those countries is exactly the same as a product that sells that much and then it has to be maintained. So every time I hire a new regulatory person to fulfill those dossiers, I already know 70% of their time, on average, is going to go into maintaining registrations that are already there. 
not about putting new product into market, whereas if we talk to our business leaders, the idea of hiring a regulatory person would be thinking, oh, I'm going to get more product into market. Well, no, only 30% of their time is going to go into that. So we're going to be growing a regulatory resource that may not be doing, uh, may not be as efficient as it needs to do. So what we've done is this. This is not rocket science. We started out with a paper process. Every single registration for new and renewal has to be submitted in country, signed off with a business plan for a new product or a renewal with the last three years sales history. It has to be signed off by in-country RA, yes, I can do this, by the country manager. It has to be aligned regionally with marketing and then globally. And they have to sign off on it. And then the regulatory uh, team that uh, does the global dossiers, the head of that particular team has to sign off and say, yes, not only do I make a commitment, do I have the resources, I've put it in a plan and I see no obstacles to putting this product into market versus what happens sometimes we start a registration and we get halfway through it and realize, uh, there is a technical document or a testing, a cytotoxicity testing that was never done, and we haven't done that upfront analysis, and now we're stuck in the middle of a, re of a registration, and we don't know where to go with it. So this is the process that we've put in place, and it's a tough one because it, it uh, took a lot of training of people, both in country and at the global headquarters. There was some resistance in some quarters. There was a lot of resistance in some quarters and there was a lot of embracing. So there was a lot of stakeholder engagement. And quite often when we're thinking about processes and we identify a gap, people will jump and say, we need an IT system. And I talked about having that and we do need it. But it's not starting out initially with that solution. You've got to map the process, lean it out, make sure it works, and then program, you get a software program and you program what your real process is. So this is what we've done. And what's the level of compliance? Well, the level of compliance is this. Our international, the team that does the dossiers, have a strict instruction that unless the documents being requested are associated for a new or renewal registration, are associated and identified with an approved internal improved registration request, you don't work on it. If you don't submit all the documentation, the business case, the product codes, it goes back in country until we've got that. It's a discipline and it's an important discipline to have. Otherwise, it's about who's my best friend in global that will do my dossier and may not necessarily be strategically valuable for the company or we're renewing a product, a class three complex product, that when we look back and find it never got launched and it's, and it's now into its fourth year. It allows us to be locally and globally aligned with standardized consistent processes, aligned with business plans and product portfolio with appropriate prioritizations. And in many ways, our, our um, Regulatory resource, as another analogy, is like a healthcare budget. We have this many diseases and this much money to spend on healthcare, so we can't do it all. We have this many products, but we have this many regulatory resources. It's finite, it is not infinite. And so there is a, an opportunity cost model that we have to look at to say, we cannot put everything everywhere, so it has to be strategic. We have to use this, conf this finite regulatory resource in the most efficient and economical way that we can and to get timely approvals. And so these are the documents that you've got to have. It's all lined up. You have to have, uh, you have, to have your product codes. We have to have an accurate list of the product codes. The requests, the dossier requirements have to go in at the time of the submission, uh, internal that is, so that we can do an analysis of whether it is feasible to put that product into market. And then we've got to make it count. We need metrics, and we need the metrics. Of, it's not about performance. It's about future planning. 
and these are the data that we put together. What is your estimated date that you're going to deliver the dossier? When have you actually delivered it? What is the estimated date of in-country submission? What is the actual date of in-country submission? What is the date of estimated uh, submission to the health authority versus actual? This is the kind of data that we collect in order to help us plan for the future. And doing deep analysis of that is very, is very useful. And it's, and it's great for the marketing people to have much better accurate estimations for their launch plans. And so we have metrics that we put out and we give greater visibility. So people can, in fact, look up at any time. Anybody who's got access to the system uh, when am I going to get my approval in Taiwan? Um, this request was put in. It's part of my strat strategic plan. Um, who's working on it? Uh, this is the estimated date. I'm expecting it, so I've got some dates. I'm going to come back and I'm going to look at it again later, and I can continue to do my forward planning. And then, at the end of the year, you can go back and do some really good statistical analysis that allows you to look at how many, how many registrations by class, by country, we were able to put into market, how long did it really take versus published timelines. And these planning for me is very, very important because otherwise it does become what, I, what in Australia we would call a bun fight to get attention to get your dossier. People in-house, in-house RA people. In the emerging markets, our, in, our emerging market regulatory affairs people are sometimes a little, dis, a little separated, not intentionally by companies disenfranchised from the global headquarters, simply because of sometimes distance, the processes that are not in place to incorporate them well, and, and language difficulties. These are our most valued resources and they need a sense of belonging, and we put a lot of effort into our local people. It's about having a sustainable workforce, and a sustainable workforce is really about treating our in-country RA people in Taiwan, in Bangkok, in, in uh, China, uh, you know, in India, with a real degree of respect that we want to appropriately remunerate them through appropriate benchmarking, that we develop their talent, and that we have uh, career development and retention plan planning. What we did last year, we took the RAPS 2007 professional regulatory uh, assessment um, paper that they put out, which talked about all the skills, experience, and knowledge at every level that regulatory people should have. We converted that into four levels of assessment, self-assessment. We rolled it out globally to every regulatory affairs person where they rated themselves as to what knowledge they felt they had and experience and didn't have. And then we sat down and we're in the process now of developing individuals 20, 70, 20, 10 models of development for them. And it's documented and it's in everybody's objectives. It's in my objectives, it's in my boss's objectives, and it's in their objectives. And it's the follow through. And the best resource we have ensuring compliance is about having excellence, having excellent staff. Um, Outsource drivers, we know what they are. Increase, sometimes we don't actually have the skills. Um, it can reduce costs and decrease time to market, but in many ways, the outsourcing that we do is really of what I would call the default, the default type of outsourcing, and that is we have to do it through our distributors where we don't have a, um, a local presence, and I'm gonna talk about how we manage those. Um, for all of the, let's just now switch tact a little bit and talk about, in terms of people outsourcing people, outsourcing regulatory, our regulatory um, or product submissions, distributors. Does every distributor have in their sales and territory agreement a clause that says you will be compliant with regulations in your country from a regulatory point of view, anti-bribery and corruption clauses? Uh, do we have processes when we change distributors, what we're going to do with our licenses? If you look at Indonesia, for example, uh, you change your distributor, you're going to be re-registering all of the products again. 
Um, do we have our, regu our distributors regulatory affairs person or their agent deeply connected into our systems? And I think that's probably a very, very big problem because I'm talking about infrastructure for the company, but how do we, how do we pull in the distributors who are doing regulatory submissions or their agents into our processes and make those processes the same. And it's a very big challenge. And I'm sure we've all had the experience of a distributor asking for a document that gets notarized and legalized and a whole dossier and it goes in the drawer and then it comes out two years later to be resubmitted, only to be asked yet again to have that same document notarized and legalized again and again. So it's just a waste of our resources. Putting in place due diligence for all third party non-sellers who do registrations on behalf of the, of the distributors, which means on behalf of us. Do we really know what gets submitted? When we give them the documents, do we know exactly? Do we construct the dossier, give it to them? Does it get submitted as is? And do we have evidence of that? And have we actually got all the contact details of all those third parties and conducted due diligence and training and copies of those submissions and an audit plan? I've already talked about who owns the license and what would it take? You might want to have a plan to own your license, so we need to know what that might actually look like. So I'll give a couple of examples what I mean. Um, if, um, and it's not a Pan Pacific example. This is a, a, a Russia example. If I'm in Russia and I have, uh, if I'm in Russia, I have a product registration, it will be in my name. It will be in the name of the, the, name of the, the legal manufacturer. If I have only a representative office, then I cannot be the last, the importer. I need a distributor to do that. I need a legal entity to be both the, in, both the license holder and the importer, the legal importer of that, of that product. So it's about what is it that you want to, what do we want to achieve for each of those countries? And so we can't make those plans unless we have all of this information in-house and spend the time to collect it systematically. And many companies have, have a program of acquiring distributors and going direct, and regulatory is often sometimes the very last afterthought of what that might mean. And so therefore we need to know um, if we're acquiring a distributor and are we doing an equity deal versus an asset deal and therefore where is our liabilities, particularly if it's our first time into that country. And there may have many implications for that. And so we need to start with regulatory at the core of those activities. So in conclusion, it's not a one size fits all. To be efficient, effective and economical, we're going to need both, but we need compliance and risk mitigation, appropriate infrastructure, but we need excellence in systems, processes and people. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Gemma. Can we have some questions? Yes. Questions? Yes. Uh, let's take a couple of questions and then we'll bring everybody together for the, for the panel. I guess I could ask at the panel too. No, shoot. Sure. Um, so I, I don't want to sound nerdy, but this presentation was very exciting for me <laughs> because it's we, it's taken my company three and a half years to get to almost exactly what you presented here. Um, we're in a paperless format though, of processes. Um, one thing that's up for discussion with us, and I'd like your input on it, as far as when you speak on the global or the corporate structure kind of leading and improving the processes and what's going to be registered, what's the best system then or structure at your global site or global headquarters to support then all of the, right. the, the country right. markets. Okay, so the, uh, let me just talk briefly about how we do this. So we've got the in-country RA, then I represent in my company international regulatory affairs and I have my team and I've got a couple of key people here who are integral in, in rolling out these processes. And then we have the global regulatory team who do all the domestic and then sitting under them are dedicated in another set of dedicated international regulatory affairs individuals and all they do are the dossiers for those international and if you like I am the interface or my and I and my team we're the interface between the local 
and that global that that global. So we meet with them on a monthly basis. We look at what are you working on, where are you up to, how does this fit in with the plan. But if you have regulatory people in your global headquarters who are doing EU, you know, doing CE marking, doing 510Ks and then doing registrations in China, it isn't going to work because we because those those markets will always be at the bottom of the list. So you've got to archive off dedicated resources. So you're set up your your position is within the corporate arm. Correct. Instance, and then you have pro product line specific regulatory specialists then that you're referencing them. Correct. Okay. Correct. Yes. Yeah, so many people are talking about regulatory strategy describing the problem you are offering here solutions. So what I'm very curious about, because you gave this example, you know, there are so many business cases, but only that many regulatory affairs people. Mm -hmm. So this, uh, the step to make the right prioritization, yeah, for sure also yeah. depends on reimbursement. Could you somehow connect this topic also into this strategy? How, how did you solve this? Very pointed question. <laughs> and I had this discussion um, just this very point um, last week, and I was talking, you will know Robert Maginot um, from Europe, uh, and we were talking, and I said, in my view, and I'm because this is the honest part, I said, I feel like we're clunky and clumsy in this area. And we are actually putting together a small task force to make that process smoother. Right now, it's, it's iterative. It's sitting down and those, pros, those um, prioritizations, sitting down looking, literally, it's a, 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 a workshop on a monthly basis to look at the priorities, set them, trade off, like the opportunity cost model, trading off, well, you know, if we get the product in here, it's going to make this much money, it's going to get reimbursed here, or, you know, we're going to push it up here, we're going to push it down here. It's a juggling, it's a juggling and negotiation right now, a little bit maybe what it's really like with government. <laughs> Um, only we're doing it internally. But what we're looking for, though, Peter, though, is, um, is a smoother process, and we're going to be focusing very much this year on that. 